will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. Good evening. Good evening. And good evening and welcome to Out of the Bag. This is Sean Maguire live on People's Internet Radio. That's www.peoplesinternetradio.com where we are seeking solutions. And tonight I really needed to have a solution to what is going on in my uh, in my uh, show tonight. So um, without further ado, I'm going to invite and uh, hopefully he's with me now. I'm going to have Freeman Jack with me for the first hour. Uh, Jack, are you with me? Good evening, Sean. I most certainly am. And good evening, people. Ha <laughs> Fantastic to have you back on Out of the Bag, available there as well. Okay, well, I mean, and specifically, the the subject, the material that we're going to move on to tonight, uh, The one of the reasons for, one of my sort of driving reasons for wanting to create the new YouTube channel was simply that um, I have become reliant on... Uh, on my YouTube subscriptions, mm. on having a, 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 a database now of subscriptions of reliable sources of information. So I know that the people who upload videos to those channels, generally speaking, those videos will be of merit and worth a look. Yes. As a consequence, my recommended YouTubes on uh uh, my recommended videos on my YouTube channel uh, often spring forth items that just have completely passed me by in any other field of research. And this liquid thorium reactor is precisely one of those. And it came up on my recommended channel, uh, on my recommended videos on my channel the other day. And although I was aware of liquid thorium reactors, uh, there had been a meme going around about three to five years ago. Mm-hmm. I think it was GM possibly uh, did a uh, one of these concept cars and um, really just for the sake of being fancy suggested that it would be powered by a liquid thorium reactor mm-hmm. um, as its power plant and they gave all the various ins and outs of that. Um and essentially, when I looked closely at just that small project, um, and also uh, the American uh, nuclear-powered uh, bomber plane uh, mm-hmm. that they developed, it, were developing in the in the 1950s, uh, was also a liquid salt reactor, but which I was also aware of. But those are the only two that I was aware of. Now the 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 nuclear powered bomber was an absolute nightmare this was a doomsday machine this thing was never ever going to go uh go into the skies over populated areas unless this was doomsday you know what i mean this thing would literally leave a trail of cancer <laughs> <laughs> every time it flew out through the sky so it was only ever going to be used as a you know in a kind of a last ditch yeah. Sort of thing. So the engines themselves spewed out radioactive waste. Lovely. <laughs> as lovely. they burn it. Pretty hideous. Yeah. So obviously I'm not looking at this as being a particularly bright idea. Okay. Uh, and, and the I'll... thorium uh, powered car, uh, when I looked closely at that, it was dressed up as this fabulous, like eco friendly, you know what I mean? No risk, this, that, and the other. When I actually looked a bit closer, some of the people that had looked into the reactor that they were, that they were postulating as the power plant for this thing, the thing produces like, um, uh, a, a plutonium byproduct that's radioactive, has got a radioactive half-life of 15 billion years. Mm. Um, one of the, um, uh, one of the, the, uh, component React chain reactions within the thorium to energy reaction are a couple of isotopes of stuff that's so damn radioactive that it makes plutonium look, you know what I mean, positively harmless. So it's like sort of thousands of times more radioactive than weapons grade plutonium. Uh, admittedly, it only springs forth for a few milliseconds and then converts into a less uh, harmful substance mm-hmm. but the prospect of having this in an engine mounted in a car capable of being involved in a high speed accident 
at any moment that the car's involved in an accident, there are going to be a number of these hugely radioactive isotopes suddenly released into the environment, and mm. I couldn't see any way that this could be in any way a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so largely my investigations into liquid thorium uh, nuclear reactors were, yes, this is doable, but not a very sensible idea. Yeah. Well, having seen this, um, let's just get the chap's name up. Um, yeah, I, I watched this video the other night. It was on your Omniverse um, Open Kirk, Kirk Sorensen, that's the uh, the chap. Um, yes, this uh, this video by uh, Kirk Sorensen, I believe he's a, a, a Swedish um, physicist mm-hmm. um, on the subject. And uh, he very simply pointed out, I mean, personally, I'm uh, probably uh, university degree level uh, understanding of steam power generation yeah. and of um, heat to electricity conversion. I've got some really technical books. I've studied the subject for absolutely donkey's years. I've applied it in various actual kind of um, scenarios. So it's a subject that I'm very sort of keenly aware of. And in this video, he simply points out that the pressurized water reactor, which is basically a kettle. Mm. Yeah. Uh, or in fact, more specifically, it's more like a pressure cooker. Okay. So we have a method of heating water and because it's pressurized and not simply vented to the air, uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, we have a way of increasing the temperature that you can heat the water to, because normally you heat water to 100 degrees, it begins to boil, and the more heat that you put in simply creates more steam, and it maintains that 100 degrees. If you pressurise it now, you're kind of keeping the steam inside the water for longer. Mm. And as a consequence, the boiling point increases. And uh, in order for a pressurized water reactor of uh, uh, all of the standard sort of modern power plants of this design, you have to raise the water to uh, approximately three to four hundred degrees centigrade, so three to four times its natural boiling point. And to do this, you have to uh, hold the thing at 15 to 100 atmospheres of pressure. This is an enormous pressure. I've dealt with pressures like this. These are the sort of pressures that you get in uh, canisters of industrial compressed gas, the sort of thing that you might use as a welder. Um, uh, and uh, vastly, you know what I mean, uh, have to be kept in steel cages these days, you know what yeah. I mean, because they're so damn dangerous because of the pressure contained. Um, and... Uh, Essentially, in order for these uh, nuclear reactors to work, they have to run at these ridiculous temperatures and these ridiculous pressures. And as a consequence, should there ever be any sort of accident within the water circuit, now we're not talking about any of the nuclear side here, this is just the kettle part. Yeah. The nuclear side is just the, 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 the gas ring under the kettle. Okay, it's the bit that gets hot. Yeah. Um, so if there's any leak in the kettle side... Essentially, this hyper-pressurized, uh, almost solid water at uh, multiple times its natural boiling point is suddenly released to the atmospheric pressure and it instantly converts to its natural state of steam. Uh, and in fact, of um, uh, superheated steam, which is actually invisible. Mm. It's invisible to the naked eye. It's a gas. Yes. So you have this 400 degrees centigrade invisible gas expanding by a thousand times its volume, uh, an explosive, it's not actually a physical explosion because there's no combustion involved, but the rates of expansion are similar to that in, say, a TNT detonation. So we have a massively destructive force uh, being contained within the very basic principles of running one of these um, nuclear power plants. And I've understood this for a long time. It's the reason for the Three Mile Island uh, accident and was closely connected with the Chernobyl accident. Yes. And also with the pumps failing at uh, Fukushima. Um, anyway, these thorium reactors, because thorium is a uh, metal salt that 
melts at a relatively low temperature. It melts at about 300 degrees centigrade. Basically, you have a liquid which is capable of transferring the sort of temperatures that this super pressurized water would normally do. Only it can do it at atmospheric pressure. Mm. And moreover, should there be a breach in this hot liquid thorium flow, when it's breach, breach, breaches into the, the atmosphere, it doesn't explosively decompress. Okay. So basically it falls out on the floor, on the floor of the, the reactor building. Anyway, I would suggest at this point, we should probably play that five minute video. Okay, before, before that we. That five put... minute audio. Because I think that he probably does a much better job than I ever could <laughs> to really summing up why this is so goddamn important. And I really can't, I can't, um, impress on the listeners enough that this possibly could be the energy solution that gets us out of the shit. Yeah. Absolutely. The only energy solution that <clears throat> I have yet to see. All of the other free energy solutions just don't stack up when studied closely. There's some that are doing a reasonable job. This works. It's established. It's 50, 60, 70 year old technology. It's known. Yeah, yeah? it is. Um, J- Jack, it, also, I, I want to say <clears throat> also that the already established nuclear power plants all around the world can, can, uh, is it easy to, um, to change over to thorium instead of what they're using already or, or convert is it... them. Um, I would imagine that new plants would probably be the, uh, the, the more economic way to generate power from thorium. Okay. But there was some very um, uh, astute minds in the audience of that particular video that we were watching, and they pointed out that there are actually some of the pre-fission um, uh, processes in the thorium chain reaction that produce some incredibly valuable metals. Mm. And that if instead of um, approaching the subject purely from an energy production point of view, if you were to view the production of these incredibly valuable metals as a, a means of generating the uh, financial uh, 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 the uh, the financial production that's required for creating the power plants. Mm-hmm then thorium could literally pay for itself in its instigation. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of these substances that's, uh, that NASA uh, uses. It's a, a plutonium isotope. It's, it's, uh, it's actually the one that's radioactive for 15 billion years. And it's the one that, that NASA has been using for all of its deep space exploration, all of its, all of its um, explorers that have gone out in, I mean, uh, beyond the, the Kuiper belt have been driven by this particular isotope of plutonium. Well, it just so happens that NASA have now used up the world's supply. Yeah. Of that particular means of plutonium, and it doesn't exist naturally. And the only way of creating it is through these plutonium salt reactors. And, uh, do you know what I mean, it's enormously valuable. Yes. yes and so is. the one waste product of this this particular technology would in fact drive a technology which would actually uh, make best use of taking that hazardous on earth material out into the stars as a means of driving you know what I mean the the vehicles of research absolutely look well, let, let's yeah. play let's play this um um recording um i i really i really want people to realize that the there there is the video is well worth uh, looking at as well especially if you're into this type of stuff and that you want to learn a bit more but this really is a five minute synopsis isn't it yeah and uh, again if anybody um wants to check up on any of the the uh, stuff that i talk about today there are supporting videos uh, if you go to the playlist section on the open omniversity channel uh, if you go to the playlist section and go to the frontier science or the, uh, what's the energy one? Um, energy solutions. Yeah. Energy solutions and frontier science Brilliant. playlists. You'll what, find, uh, the supporting videos for all of the, this material. Great stuff. And what I picked up from this is that, um, you know, yes, there are any devices out there. Yes, there are people looking at new technologies and all the rest of it, but there has never been such a global solution for all our requirements. Uh, this seems to be it. So let's play this five minute, uh, 
recording, okay? Absolutely. The heavy water reactor will use about 0.7% of the uranium energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of 1%. They both do terrible. At normal pressures, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run at over 70 atmospheres of pressure. You have to build a water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. The number one accident people worry about, pressure is lost. Water that's being held 300 Celsius flashes to steam, its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. If you don't get emergency coolant to the fuel in the reactor, it can overheat and melt. This is what drives the design of this building. So if this happens, all the steam is captured in this building. Now the reactors we have today use uranium oxide as a fuel. It's a ceramic material, chemically stable, but not very good at transferring heat. If you lose pressure, you lose your water, and soon your fuel will melt down and release the radioactive fission products within it. So they have a series of emergency systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on. The tsunami came and knocked them all out. Maybe people sometimes say, is nuclear energy safe? And the first thing I say is, well, which one? Thousands of different ways to do nuclear energy. I'll say, is the car safe? Well, which one? I had the good fortune to learn about a different form of nuclear power. The liquid fluoride thorium reactor. We can fully burn up the thorium in this reactor versus only burning up part of the uranium in a typical light water reactor. It's not based on water cooling and it doesn't use solid fuel. It's based on fluoride salts as a nuclear fuel. You have to heat them up to about 400 degrees Celsius to get them to melt, but that's actually perfect for trying to generate power in a nuclear reactor. Here's the real magic. They don't have to operate at high pressure. They don't have to use water for coolant and there's nothing in the reactor that's going to make a big change in density. Unlike the solid fuels that can melt down if you stop cooling them, these liquid fluoride fuels are already melted. In normal operation, you have a little piece of frozen salt that you've kept frozen by blowing cool gas over the outside of the pipe. If there's an emergency and you lose all the power to your nuclear power plant, the little blower stops blowing, the frozen plug of salt melts, and the liquid fluoride fuel inside the reactor drains out of the vessel, through the line, and into another tank called a drain tank. In water-cooled reactors, you generally have to provide power to the plant to keep the water circulating and to prevent a meltdown. But if you lose power to the lifter, it shuts itself down all by itself without human intervention. A staggeringly impressive level of safety, even if there's physical damage to the reactor. Thorium is a naturally occurring nuclear fuel that is four times more common in the Earth's crust than uranium. It's so energy dense that you can hold a lifetime supply of thorium energy in the palm of your hand. We could use thorium about 200 times more efficiently than we're using uranium now. Because the lifter is capable of almost completely releasing the energy in thorium, this reduces the waste generated over uranium by factors of hundreds and by factors of millions over fossil fuels. We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery, but we could generate these liquid fuels from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and from water, much like nature does. We could generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere, making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which could be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel sustainable and self-produced. You can see that uranium-235 is like on par with silver and platinum. Can you imagine burning platinum for energy? And that's what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff and we're not burning thorium. You know, some people who are kind of environmentalists and they say, listen, nuclear power is not sustainable. We're gonna run out of uranium. Okay, I will yield that point to you if we're talking about today's nuclear technology. In 2007, we used five billion tons of coal 31 billion barrels of oil, and 5 trillion cubic meters of natural gas, along with 65,000 tons of uranium to produce the world's energy. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri. Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? And he goes, I think about 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on earth that are just like my mind. It's a nice mind, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on earth where this is found. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean 
for human civilization because we're not going to run out of this stuff. We will never run out. It is simply too common. Well, there we have it. That was the five-minute story in reactors, LFTRs, in five minutes. Um, <clears throat> quite incredible that um, not only is this stuff, if you like, for us uninitiated uh, people, um, in abundance, it also has many, many other uh, really, really great qualities. And, uh, Jack, are you back with me? Hello, I certainly am, Sean. Brilliant. Well, there's also a couple of questions in the chat room. Um, that I'm going to read out to you. Uh, you're in the chat oh, room yourself, so you probably saw them. Yeah. Um, Nick himself, a question for Jack. Can he confirm thorium is the main waste product of the Chinese rare earth mining? So thorium reactors could help with the resources required for other alternative energy and use, and use a currently wasted item. Absolutely. And the longer video that I've posted there goes into great lengths to explaining precisely the relationship between the various um, uh, prevalences of the rare earth elements and how much thorium would literally be a byproduct of their mining. And so the, the, the material for this particular uh, uh, fuel would be literally a waste product of a necessary uh, mining industry that's currently taking place. And so, yes, it is the primary byproduct of the, the rare earth mining. That's incredible, as, isn't it? As, uh, as somebody is keen to point out, the, the, uh, as a, um, uh, at its uh, current market value, the one American chap in the video who has got a mine uh, mining uh, rare earth in America uh, the thorium in his mine is worth multi billions, so he's sat on his fortune the second that they start using thorium as an energy source. Absolutely, yeah. I'm going to look in the bog and see what I can find. <laughs> well, the, uh, well, this is the point, and that uh, the thorium is very much like um, aluminium and oxygen, in the in as much as it has a more or less universal ubiquitous distribution. So this would be a very difficult energy source for any elite to uh, possibly um, take control of. on, monopolize. Ah, uh, Jesus, Jack, they're taking over water and air. Oh well, I'm, of course they will. They will make uh, every effort to. But this is. I'm also keen to sort of um, ally this discussion of macro uh, energy generation to the uh, developments. And moreover, I mean, this is the other issue: is that the the, the frontier science that we're starting to see is uh, I, I was genuinely beginning to think that science was running out of potential answers and the number of potential problems that I saw stacking up that appeared to be insurmountable 10 years ago was beginning to depress me, frankly. Right. The world that my children appeared to be about to inherit, uh, I saw no great hope for us as a species to and, make and, it through. And this, and this has rekindled your hope, has it? I have found so many. Uh, I mean, I mean, this, and again, this, it, it's this. There appears to be sort of a Goldilocks principle at work here. And I'm finding it not only in the latest of theoretical physics, but everywhere. Uh, there appears to be this incredible level of uh, harmonizing of the, the factors that determine the nature of stuff. <laughs> um, and that the... Uh, the awareness of the interconnectedness mm. is opening up branches of science that 10, 15 years ago would have been so fringe. Yeah. I mean, the number of uh, uh, seminars that I currently listen to where often the physicist or whoever will come on the stage and the first thing that they'll say is, look, if I gave this talk 10 years ago, I'd be lucky to get out of the hall without being lynched. Yes. You know what I mean? This is a very different time that we find ourselves in. And moreover, that chap, the, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kirk Sorensen, um, he's open sourcing most of his work there. 
brilliant. So as well as publishing a book on the subject, he's also published the book as a free PDF online. Great stuff. Listen, what do you say to those people who, who um, you know, look, myself, I mean, what, what did I, when did I become aware and want to get involved in, in, in trying to change what's going on in this world was when, you know, um, relatives of mine were, were dying of cancer in, in, the, in, in Dundalk because of the Gulf Stream from Sellafield, Thorpe, Windscale, whatever they wanted to change mm. its name to the next time. So I got involved with, with CND and well, that type of stuff. No, no, but I just can ask you the question, Jack. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Um, yeah. and what it is, is, is surely this is still damaging our resources, inc- in, you know, in, including mining right. and all this type well, of I stuff. I can actually answer that and um, uh, Donichad's uh, question okay. about um, uh, 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 using an oil as an alternative substitute. Uh, he would be entirely correct for thermal transfer of any other nature. Um, so as a replacement for the water in a steam plant, there are certain f- other fluids that can be used. Generally speaking, they come with more complications than uh, make it worthwhile using anything other than water, which is why steam largely is still, you know, I mean, our, our, I mean, our most technical power plants are basically still a kettle. Uh, they're, they're exactly the same as the very first ever steam turbines, which were, I mean, the turbine here was 18... Oh, God, I would be guessing mid-1800s anyway, 1830 to 1850 was sure. the first steam turbine. Mm-hmm. So we're not talking about modern technology. Yeah. Um, and the the issue with this, uh, the pressurised water reactors being, uh, I mean, the, the father of the the steam locomotive, uh, uh, Robert, Tra- Robert, Robert Trevithick? Trevithick, Trevithic, yeah. Anyway. Right surname, not too sure about the, the Christian name. Um, James Watt wanted him lynched. Yeah. Um, for daring to use the high pressure steam. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and essentially during the age of steam, uh, the number of, um, the carnage due to boiler explosions was ridiculous to the point of, uh, nowadays if you want to actually use a pressurized steam boiler, you have to actually make two. And the ministry will blow up one of them, <laughs> destroy it to find out how strong it is before they'll let you use the other one. Yeah, Jack. Um, Jack, listen. There's a there's a um, Tony Z in in the chat room, um, mm-hmm. um, is talking about we could be using water, splitting it into hydro and oxygen to burn and produce energy without radioactive systems. But what I what I got from the the, the videos, and you can correct me if I'm wrong as well, Jack, is is that there is no radioactivity from this. It actually gets rid of it. Is that true? Largely, it is the, the essentially. Well, this is where we were getting to. The reason why oil can't be used to replace thorium in this particular system. Certainly, there are liquid uh, salt systems. There's sodium. Uh, liquid sodium is used in some of the big solar farms in Spain, where they have the big mirror arrays, where all of the mirrors point onto a single spot. And what they do there is they heat up. Uh, standard salt you know what i mean your table salt mm-hmm. and they heat it up so much that they turn it into a, a liquid and then they use that superheated liquid salt as the means of transferring the heat away from the the focus point and off to turn it into and again they use that liquid salt to generate steam they'll they'll then convert that through heat exchangers into water which will be used to drive standard steam turbine generators okay um <clears throat> The, but but the is there radio, is there radioactivity from, from? Yes. 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 Thorium <laughs> is radioactive. And this is something that is very keen to go into and, and, uh, dials back into what I was saying about the, uh, plutonium with the, the plutonium isotope that NASA use with the ridiculous sort of 13 billion year half-life. Mm-hmm. Is that basically, uh, although through the various sort of anti-nuclear campaigns, we have been taught to fear the length of half-lives yes. of nuclear waste. You know what I mean? Oh, this has got a, a 20,000 year half-life. That's got a, a, a 40,000 year half-life. That means it's going to be radioactive for 40,000 years, 20,000 years. No, that's wrong. I mean, that statement in and of itself is wrong. 
basically it will become half as radioactive in 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. And in the next 20,000 years, it will become half as radioactive again. And then in the next 20,000 years, half as radioactive as again. And so for a piece of radioactive uranium to actually deplete lead might take several billion years. Okay. Okay. But during these slow rates of decay, these slower rates of decay happen using the uh, 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 emitting the the much lower energy particles, subatomic particles, the the alpha and the beta uh, radioactive uh, emissions. Generally speaking, only travel a matter of inches away from the surface. Uh, they may interact with certain gases in the atmosphere and create radioactive isotopes of various naturally occurring gases due to their sort of radioactive interactions. So you tend to get the the air around a beta or alpha emitter may start to get a much higher bias of things like radon than it would naturally have because mm. the radioactivity of the... Uh, the alpha and the beta particles will start to make isotopes of the various atmospheric gases and turn out a few radioactive gaseous isotopes. Okay. Now, these are obviously quite dangerous. Yeah. But the point with the thorium is that the uh, the thorium itself is naturally radioactive, but it's one of these incredibly slow uh, decay um, I think uh, 14, 14 or 15 billion year half-life. Okay. So in the entire age of the universe, it would only lose half of its radioactive decay particles Okay. as a natural... Can, can you explain what that decay. means to us? Okay, well, that would basically mean is that if it was... Um, let's say it was a sparkler. Okay. And the, uh, the, the sparkles were these alpha and beta particles. The alpha particles tend to travel in quite straight lines, but fizzle out quite quickly within two or three inches. Mm -hmm. And the beta particles, if memory serves correctly, I may be slightly wrong on this, um, do a bit of a, a, a sort of a corkscrew as they come out of the surface. Uh, and again, generally only make it a half to a, a three quarters of an inch away from the surface. Now, if these um, sparklers travel through your body, through your the the atoms, through the, the the cells of your body, because they're very highly energetic, they tend to knock bits off of stuff. And so, with a prolonged exposure to these things, you will develop things like tumours and and what have you, malignancies. Uh, if you ingest them, it can be quite dangerous. So ingesting an alpha or a beta emitter into your lungs would basically mean that although it's only releasing radioactivity within a very local area, that local area happens <laughs> to be contained within the core of your body. Uh -huh. So inhaling this stuff is pretty bad. But essentially, we're not talking about gamma particles. Basically, anything that's a gamma emitter the, the gamma rays will go through several inches of lead. Uh, they they are almost guaranteed if you have a gamma uh, if you have a gamma particle go through your body, it will go all the way through your body, and it will almost guarantee knock bits off of your cells on its way through. It's like being shot with a microscopic bullet. <laughs> it's going to take bits of you out on the way through. Okay. Uh, now the point being that this thorium is an incredibly slow, uh, low background radiation, naturally occurring radioactive isotope, that when bombarded with uh, 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 more active um, radioactive isotopes, such as uh, 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 power plant grade uh, uranium-235, right. which will be em emitting uh, very high energy sort of gamma particles, X-rays, and uh, quite a lot of alpha and beta. When uh, this stuff is brought into a mixture uh, in liquid form with the thorium, it starts to split the thorium atoms. And when it splits the thorium atoms, the decay products from the thorium atoms are hugely radioactive. 
uh, release massive amounts of energy, but their decay, their their half lives are in milliseconds or seconds. Mm. And so within seconds of having been created within this li- body of this liquid salt, they immediately decay into something far less harmful um, and and stop emitting energy. And essentially this chap has, has fathomed out a way of of cycling the the two streams, the hot not the hot, but the, the, the sort of radioactive and the less radioactive streams of liquid salts. And by injecting just a tiny amount of additional thorium with each cycle and by siphoning off the unwanted uh, uh, heavy radioactive isotopes, which is quite simply a, chemi- a matter of chemical extraction separate to the, the main generator and nothing, again, complex or, or difficult for a, a chemist to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that you basically can recycle all of the uranium that you were using to trigger the initial reaction acts as, I mean, he, what does he call it? Um, he says it's not a catalyst, it's a pseudo-catalyst. Right. Because essentially a catalyst isn't used up by its reaction. Well, that's not specifically speaking true of this, no. because the uranium-235 may be used up to uranium-232, which is a much safer, much less hazardous form of uranium and can be used in various other applications. And these are the sort of isotopes that can essentially be hived off in a similar sort of process to the way that we get all of the various petrochemicals out of crude oil. Okay. So essentially we do have a a, a nuclear process, but this nuclear process takes what is currently weapons-grade material. It takes the stuff that nuclear bombs are made of, and it uses the stuff that nuclear bombs are made of in a... Um, in a uh, nuclear furnace of salts within the body of the liquid salts. And because these liquid salts are at room temperature, at room pressure, at atmospheric pressure, they're not super pressurized, there's nothing fancy going on here. Most of the circulation even isn't even pumped within these systems. The liquid salt will simply have convection currents that will carry it around the system. So Mm. the hot stuff will move to the top and the cold stuff will move to the bottom. And all of these sort of things in that five-minute video, he talks about a frozen salt plug. And that's simply by keeping a a simple fan, uh, a cooling fan blowing on a pipe that connects the main system to a drain tank, you keep that pipe below the, 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 the liquid temperature for thorium and the thorium freezes Okay. In that bit of the pipe. Now, we're talking about freezing being anything under 300 degrees centigrade. Okay, so that frozen thorium creates a, a, a static plug within the drain pipe, which would allow all of the thorium out of the main reactor chamber. And what he says is that essentially in, in any uh, any accident situation where all of the power is cut, the first power that's cut is the power of this little cooling fan that keeps this frozen plug of thorium in place, and the thing naturally unfreezes and all of the thorium is dumped out of the main reactor chamber and into a safe kind of buried uh, storage chamber f- where it has to wait only a few minutes for the dangerous reaction byproducts to have been completely neutralised. Okay, well, that's brilliant. And, and look, we've got, only got about four minutes left um, of, of this oh, section. Oh, jeez, I've only even got carbon-60. Oh, jeez. Well, look, hang, hang, hang go, to the, go to the, the frontier science and the energy solutions, folks. There's some fascinating stuff on, uh, on the, the fullerene revolution, on the, the carbon-60 revolution, and again, without power to drive the, the chemical plants that are going to be needed to produce these solutions, there's a, there's a new fullerene, a new, um, it's a, it's a nanoparticle, it's a, a flat sheet of carbon that's so thin that it's transparent. Mm. It can be used on windows. And when you use it as a film on a window, you can use it either as a reflective screen to bounce the light back out. Or you can use it to keep, sorry, bump your mic. Or you can use it to keep the heat in the room. Or, and also, in between, 
generate electricity by the photons that are passing through the window of a wavelength that you don't want to allow in or out. <laughs> okay. So basically every window that is, is, is made once this stuff goes into large scale manufacture will have two little, uh, wire connectors on it. And we'll sit there and we'll produce 200 watts of available electricity. Not only when the sun is shining, because this stuff actually converts infrared into electricity. And, of course, that just needs a warm room. Okay. Okay, listen. So, I mean, yeah, just fascinating stuff coming on the horizon, people. Do not fret. <laughs> and, and, and we don't need to go for the ridiculous sort of free energy solutions, fringe stuff. Well, they're not, so all, ridi- they're with not the, all ridiculous, with though. The, with the, um, yeah. with uh, Gerald Pollack's work on exclusion layer, layer water, on, on the fourth phase of water, on liquid crystal water, with the nanoparticle, uh, especially with the, the fullerene revolution that's happening, with room temperature superconductors literally on the horizon. We're talking about a, a world that couldn't have been imagined by the the authors of Agenda 21, and it simply it's a world that they couldn't have planned for, and it's not a world that they can have pre-disastered. It it's great. We're... Listen, I've got a couple of questions in the chat room that I wanted to put to you, Jack. I'm going to have to ask you to come back on, mate. Yeah, I've, of course. I've, I've got my next guest. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to hang around. I'm going to hang around for your uh, for your last guest anyway. I'll uh, I'll if you if you if you drop me out of the call and just call me back in when you have got your last guest. I on, will, of course. Shut but, up and mute out. But quickly <laughs> before you go, <laughs> yes, I do want to say that um, Martin's been asking um, in the chat room, and I wanted I'm going to have to scroll back to get it. Um, and, and basically you can maybe answer that the next time or even in a nutshell, say why now. Uh, Sean, mm-hmm. could you ask your guest why we should be talking about thorium as a way to produce energy when there is much more better ways, and so he says, to do this such as magnets and coils and will cause no damage unlike anything that's been talked about? Energy density. That's the that's it. It's it's all it's down to energy density. We just simply we all of the alternatives require such vast um, uh, 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 valuable land resources and material resources to construct them. They're they're unfeasible on a global. You can look at these in local solutions, and yes, there's a lot of things that are coming. But the given the world that we have. Given the established system that we have, without imagining some fantastic new solution that's just on the horizon, just with what we've got, this is the only thing that I've come across so far that even remotely comes close I've got to you. giving us a, a way out of this. And we need a bloody way out of this. Okay. Monoculture is going to come to an end. No, I hear you. Soon. I hear you, Jack. The material Jack. resources are gone to Jack. sustain monoculture. When monoculture collapses, we lose three and a half billion <clears throat> from the face of the planet. Okay. Like that. Right. Jack. We need also, to we can't, also, Excuse Jack, Jack, before you go, we can, and I don't want you to answer this, we can't mm-hmm. slag off great people doing great work in energy devices and energy systems, even oh, if, even, even, not, no, even, I didn't mean even, to, in any way, uh, even, even, that. finish I didn't in, in, in any way mean to dismiss that. I simply mm-hmm. mean that the, the, the solutions are actually there already. Yep. And the, the the alternative stuff is all great. It is yeah? great, but you did come across as though you were saying it wasn't great. Uh, so, uh, kind of. So I wanted. Uh, this is, so I. This is seventy. This Jack. is seventy year old stuff. Yeah, this doesn't require the the adoption okay. of of any fanciful or or exotic theories. Okay. This is the, 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 there was a, 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 th- a thorium reactor producing electricity in 1956. Yeah, I hear you. Happily. Jack, I, I, I don't, I don't want to lower your mic <laughs> just to, just to finish the, the this part, <laughs> you know, and, uh, it's difficult to finish a sentence. What I'm trying to say right. is, cheers, mate. I, I'm, what I'm yeah. trying to say is, um, there are many, many people doing much, much great work all around the world. I've seen it. I've spoken to them. I've, I've been involved with talking to people about this stuff. And what they're doing will get people off grid. It will get people out of the system and all that type of stuff. And until this gets on board and until we move in this direction and we do have the infrastructure to, to, to pr- produce, um, thorium nuclear reactors, etc., they are a magical solution, okay? And I just wanted to put that across. All right, mm. mate? They are. 
So I would suggest I would suggest that we can argue another uh, time, Jack. Uh, Kirk Sorensen or whatever his name is, his uh, plans are far more great. Um, well, let's see. He's it. talking about energy transmission as being one of the primary sins of the current situation. So he's talking about these things being domestic. Okay. Power supplies where I, we export. No, I energy. hear you. This is to me, and I agree with you, and that's why I'm talking to you about it because I was excited about it as, as you were. Yep. Is that this is a global solution? Okay. Yep. And it, and and like I say, a it's open source. Uh, B it appears to be um, uh, Jack, moving I gotta away go, mate. from centralized grid and uh, towards domestic local production. Okay. With, with, ex, with, with respect ex, to my ex, next ex. guest, I have got to go, Jack. All right. Um, I have. All right. Okay. You know, and I love you loads. Back in if you want me, <laughs> I do. I do. I do. And I'm going <laughs> to pop on a tune now and call in my next de- guest, Freeman Jack. That was wonderful. It's made a lot of people think. Uh, and rethink things. Thank you so much for coming out on Out of the Bag. You're very welcome, Sean. I'll catch you in an hour or so. Cheers, mate. Okay. So I'm just going to play Jefferson Airplane White Rabbit. <laughs> 